Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Three of the world's largest religions, over four billion people, trace the origin of their faith back to one man, Avraham, Ibrahim, Abraham. This flawed man thought his life was complete, but God called him to something bigger than himself. He had an epic thousand mile journey of faith, deceit, prayer, doubt, adultery, and promise. But his outsized role in history isn't defined by his big decisions. It was the daily choices and small steps on his path to purpose that made an eternal impact. In this, he is not alone. God has a purpose for you that is bigger than the stars. You are loved and your life matters. Your story is greater than the sum of its parts. God's purpose for you starts where you are right now, today. With each step you take, you can live in God's grand purpose. God can direct even the smallest steps of faith toward an eternal impact on your path to purpose. Let's start now. All right, welcome. So glad that you're here for our back to school kickoff as we start in on a new series. I am Pastor Ken. If we haven't had a chance to meet, if you come in maybe during the summer, also known as Pastor Werline. I mention that because just the other night at the football fields where I was with uh, my boys, I, I was packing up my chair after a game and a, another family was coming in and, a, and, the, and the man looked at me and, and he said, hey, hey, you, you're, and you never know whether to help him or not, and, but he looked like he really wanted to try to get it, and so I, I was like, yeah, and, and, and he said, you, 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 Pastor Wiener. I said, no, but you were really trying, I'm thinking, and, and uh, nobody can take that away from you. Uh, it's actually Wurline, so, um, but you can call him Pastor Ken if that's easier. So take your Bible, and we're going to go to Genesis, the first book in the Bible. If you need a Bible, why don't you wave at one of the ushers? They're coming down in the aisles, and they're glad to let you borrow one. And it's our gift to you if you don't have a Bible. We're going to go in a few moments to Genesis chapter 12. So that's at the very start of the whole Bible, Genesis chapter 12. 12. And uh, while you're turning there, I'll tell you uh, about another incident that happened to the football field. Uh, a mom, uh, <clears throat> she said to me, well, Pastor Ken, I guess just a few more days and we'll be back at school and it'll be Groundhog Day all over again. Now, of course, I knew, as many of you do, she was referring to the funny film of a few decades ago called Groundhog Day, in which Bill Murray plays an egocentric TV weatherman who's assigned to Puxatawney, Pennsylvania to cover Groundhog Day. And he hates the assignment. He hates the town. He hates the job. He hates everything about it. Can't wait to get back to Pittsburgh. But a snowstorm strikes and strands him there in Puxatawney, and he can't get back. And when he wakes up the next morning, it's Groundhog Day. And when he wakes up the next morning, it's Groundhog Day again. And the next morning, it's Groundhog Day. Every single day is Groundhog Day, and he can't get out of Groundhog Day. So he asked this guy named Ralph, what would you do? If you were stuck in one place and every day was exactly the same and nothing that you did ever mattered. And Ralph says, well, that just about sums it up for me. <laughs> and I think that just about sums it up for a lot of people who feel kind of like nothing you're doing is really making that much difference in the world. Like every day is wash, rinse, 
repeat. Some of you, you feel like your marriage, maybe your marriage is kind of in a rut. Or maybe it's your job, just another day, another dollar. Or maybe it's the same old place that you've lived forever. Or maybe it's all of the above. You'd like to feel like your life is making a big difference, but it really feels more like you're in this perpetual cul-de-sac, just going around and around in a circle, which brings us to the series that we're starting called Path to Purpose. We're going to learn today that this old Groundhog Day phenomenon is nothing new to our generation. Because as a matter of fact, we're going to go back some 4,000 years today. And we're going to meet another family who wasn't going anywhere fast themselves. Originally, their names were Abram and Sarai. Now later, God's going to change their names to Abraham and Sarah. But when we meet them in God's word, they were not spring chickens. He was 75, and she was right around 65. And all their life, they'd suffered from infertility. Couldn't conceive, no matter what they tried. Now, even today, infertility can fray the emotions of any couple, right? But you have to understand that back in that day, it was even worse of a stigma than it is today. Because back then... (laughs) Well, for one thing, they didn't have social security. The only social security you would have when you grew old in convalescence was your offspring who would take care of you. But Abraham and Sarah, they had no such future. And what really stung is that the name Abram means daddy. So every time somebody called his name, daddy, Don't you know he was thinking, yeah, but I'm not one. Life just hadn't turned out the way that he'd surely hoped it would. And it wasn't looking a bit promising either. And I'm sure that he tried, they tried to talk to God about it, but here again they were hitting a dead end because Joshua 24 2 will later tell us that Abram's family worshiped idols. They didn't know the one true God when we meet them. When we meet them, they've migrated to a place called Haran. But years, years and years before that, they'd lived in Ur of the Chaldeans, which is roughly 200 miles south of modern-day Baghdad. And you should know that Ur and Haran were both centers of lunar worship. And Abram's father, Terah, meant moon. So the idol that they were most likely worshiping when we first meet them was the moon god called Nana. See, in those days, folks saw the new moon as a crescent-shaped boat in which an impressive but totally impersonal moon god, Nana, would sail across the sky once per month. So put all this together, this background that we have. What's... What's, what's God's word telling us? Don't miss it. It's, sign- sin- it's sending us a very clear signal here. That signal being if you've ever felt like your life wasn't turning out so right, or like you were going nowhere fast, or like you're just getting older and your hopes were dying and you're just staring at the moon night after night, then buckle your seatbelt because what we're going to read next is just for you. Now, Let's look at it. Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, your father's household, to the land I'll show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you'll be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed by you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 when he set out from Haran. And he took his wife Sarai and his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan until they arrived there. 
Now, one of the things I love about this story that we're going to look at here in the next several weeks coming up is that when Abram first meets God, there's nothing particularly good or holy or virtuous or righteous about him at all. There's nothing to merit in his life whatsoever that someday he would be enshrined in stained glass windows all around the world. He had no glow about his head, none of that. And it's very important that that you and I see that because I think sometimes when we come to a story like this, we tend to divorce ourselves from that and say, yeah, but that's this Bible hero. and No, what he's trying to tell us, what God is trying to tell us in his word is Abram started out just like you. He was just an ordinary guy who didn't even know the one true God. That's how it all started. But three things happened. So if you're a note taker, here's the first of the three. First thing that happened we see in this text is that God made himself known to Abram. He introduced himself to Abram. We see that in verse one. How did he introduce himself to Abram? That part we're not told. So we don't know whether maybe he appeared in some supernatural form of nature like the burning bush that he would introduce himself later to Moses. We don't know if he introduced himself from a thundering voice of, of heaven like he would do when he introduced himself to Paul. We don't know if he introduced himself by taking on some sort of pre incarnate physical form that was actually standing before. We don't know any of that, but what we do know is that somehow or another, he made himself known to Abram. And by the way, God is still very much in the business of making himself known to us today. Why? Because he wants you to know him. He wants you to know him. And you, and you, and you. He wants you to know him And many of us, we could tell our own stories of how we met God and how we got to to first knowing him. I talk to people throughout the years who who had their first encounter with God sort sort of through a mystical experience. Maybe it was a, a dream that they had or maybe some sort of supernatural healing that they experienced. And that's where they first met God. For others, they were attending a revival service or maybe they went to a camp or maybe they went to a retreat and everything just became sort of clear to them. For others, still, it was just sitting in an ordinary church service that they'd gone to and they weren't really expecting anything to happen. But all of a sudden, everything came clear and God came in. And that's where they met God. And a number of people over the years have met God through just picking up a Bible and reading the Bible. In fact, there's a whole ministry committed to putting Bibles in hotels and this sort of because many times people just pick up a Bible and read it. And something happens. That's how it happened for for my friend Rob. Rob Price is his name. Very smart fella. He'd graduated from Stanford and then had gone on to Yale to do his PhD work. When he tells the story, he says, oh, I was every bit an agnostic and maybe atheistic when I was at at Yale. I, uh, I only had an interest in academia And in fact, I would have liked to have tried to figure out how to disprove God. But then he describes the story. He says, but then one cold, snowy Connecticut evening, sitting in his apartment by himself, he says, for some reason, I pulled the Bible off the shelf and I opened it up and I just began to read it. And I got to Matthew 22 where Jesus says, I'm not the God of the dead, but of the living. And he said in that moment, it was just like the the tuning fork of his soul had been struck and God came in and he knew he's real. That's the moment that he became personal to Rob. And that changed everything. As a matter of fact, in time, he would change his trajectory and go into ministry. And today, he serves in a church just right in this area. He's one of my dear pastor friends right here in this area. But when the story started, there was nothing particularly spiritual at all about him. No halo above his head or anything. But then God introduced himself. And that's when things began to change. And God wants you to know him too. 
particularly if you haven't got to know him personally. In fact, he makes it so much easier for us to get to know him than it was 4,000 years ago in the days of Abram. You say, how is that? Well, let's just inventory some things that we have that Abram didn't have. For one thing, he lived before there was a Bible. It hadn't been put together yet. There was no Bible for him to pick up and to read. And for that matter, there was no prophet who had ever come along for God. There was no John the Baptist preparing the way and saying this is the the way of the Lord. There was none of that. There was no preachers or churches for him to go and sit and listen, think about the things of God. There was none of that. Today, we've got vibrant churches, not just this one, but there's many uh, just right here, even in this city, where, where people can experience God if you would just but go to the great assembly and that you'd be there. And people consistently say, boy, I experienced God when I was there. And if you want supplemental resources with technology, you can listen to 10 or 20 podcasts of great sermons from preachers all around the world every single week. We have so much more available to us to help us get to know God than somebody like Abram had way back then. And not to mention, we got Bible studies that meet during the week. We got grow groups for men and women and young adults and co-ed, you know, grow groups where people have life-changing encounters with God through community. Um, And so nowadays, I, I think it's really true what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1. There's really no excuse nowadays for not noticing or getting to know God. He's really made himself very, very meetable, very knowable. And in addition, if all those things weren't enough, we have yet one more advantage that Abram didn't have. Think about the sequence of time. Abram lived 4,000 years ago. And as we'll learn in the coming weeks... He is going to have offspring, and through that offspring will come more offspring and more offspring and more offspring. And about 2,000 years later, they'll come into this world a man named Jesus, the Savior of the world, God with flesh on him the fullest and finest revelation of God ever. When he revealed himself in such a way as to say, you've always wondered what I look like, well now just look. That's why Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We live after Jesus came. So there's so many more reasons we have to get to know God than than Abram had, but even notwithstanding all of those deficits that that Abram uh, had, all the things he was lacking in that vacuous religious wilderness 4,000 years ago, God made himself known to him. And Abram was willing to believe him and to trust him. And that's the second big thing you've got to jot down. The second move in this text. Abram believed God. Now think about this. Let's put ourselves into the, the, the story. M- imagine that you're 75 years old. You've lived in one place your whole life. You're very much settled in and you've got everything established around your homestead and your familiar city and your friends and community. Every, you've, just, you've been there all your life. And then suddenly God appears to you And he says, now I want you to pack up everything. And I want you to hit the road. And I'm going to take you to a a promised land. And I'll give you some more directions as you get moving. But I want you to get moving. Can you imagine the conversations that that Abram must have had? Chuck Swindoll paraphrases at least one uh, using the divine or sanctified imagination. You just imagine somebody coming up and saying, hey, Abram, I see you're, uh, you're packing up, yeah. Leaving town, huh? Yeah, we are. Um, well, how long do you plan to be gone? Permanently. Like, we're moving. Now, Abram, I don't know if you've thought about this, but you, you're not a spring chicken. You're 75, and your whole world is here and you're telling me that you're going to pick up and you're going to go start somewhere else? And, and so where is this that you're going? 
to which Abram would have said, I don't exactly know. So let me get this straight, Abram. You're begging everything that you have, leaving everything safe and familiar to go to a place that you've never been. Have you lost your mind? And don't you know, Abram might have been tempted to say maybe. And yet he said, I met God. And I know that I know that I know he is real. And there was something about him that enabled me to know he's personal and that he cares for me and that he loves me. And I trust that this is going to work out. Additionally, he, he told me, I'm going to, something about offspring and other blessings that I can't even quite wrap my mind around, but we've got to do this. We've got to move with him. I believe him. That belief is what the Bible says saved Abram. As a matter of fact, throughout the rest of the Old and the New Testaments, Abram is going to serve as the gold standard of faith. You're going to see his name appear over and over the faith of Abram, the faith of Abram, the faith of Abraham. What did he do? He believed God. He trusted God. So what saved him? His goodness? No. His virtuousness? No. His halo? No, he had none. What saved him? He believed God. He just believed God. In fact, we're going to see next week and in the weeks to come, there was plenty not virtuous about him, but at the core, he had taken God's head in his hand and said, I believe. I trust you. I'm going to go with you. And that's why James will tell us in 2.23, he became God's friend. Isaiah 41 is going to tell us that as well. Now, you know the problem with most of us, even those of us who have met God, even those of us who know God, you know what the problem is? We don't trust God. And I think the reason we don't trust God is because a lot of us are control freaks. I don't know anything about that myself, personally. (laughs) But I think many of us have a hard time believing that he really has our best interests in mind. I can't, number of the times I've had conversations with people over the years who've said, you know, I just, I'm, I'm afraid to really surrender to God because what if he asks me to change careers or something like big like that? Or what if he tells me to break up with my girlfriend? Or what if he tells me not to get married to, to him? Or what if he asks me to give away some of my money to some people or a ministry or a cause that has a need and I have to let go of something that's very important to me? What's at the root of all those statements? Doubt. Doubt that he is trustworthy. But, but here, just, just, I just want to challenge you in this moment. Let's just, for the sake of argument, let's just imagine that whatever he was ever asking you to do is better. That it just really is better, better, better than anything you could achieve if you kept your hands on the steering wheel and kept living the insignificant, short-sighted, circular, cul-de-sac, groundhog day life that you feel stuck in. What if the apostle was right, apostle Paul was right when he said um, that God can do immeasurably more than you could ever ask or imagine? What if that's really true? So last Wednesday night, three nights, four nights ago, whatever it was, I, uh, I was having a hard time getting to sleep. I was lying in bed. Finally, I decided, well, I guess I'm just, I'll get back up. And so I walked out into the dark of the living room, sat down in my prayer chair, and I had hardly sat down before the thought shot across my mind. August 15th, 2018. And I pondered that for a moment and knew why God had surely put that thought on my mind. 
Because, you see, it was an anniversary of sorts. 20 years ago, on August 15th, 1998, I took my biggest Abraham-like step of faith ever and moved to this area. Why? Because I had heard God telling me, go. You're going to start a new work in this area. Oh, don't think I didn't have every reason in my mind also available as, as to why I shouldn't go. I was happily employed at a, at a big, large church with a lot of resources and a lot of people, and, and, and I was sort of the fair-haired, I did have some back then, a, a young pastor, the associate pastor, and they, they were so good to me, and I had every reason not to leave that except that I knew God had said, but I want you to go and I want you to do this. So I'm sitting there in the dark Wednesday night, just remembering all the, the things that I was afraid of, all the reasons that I had. I don't know if this is right. God, how, how, I don't, how will I ever meet people in the spring area? How will I ever make contacts and friends and wh where would we ever hold a service and and what if nobody wants to come what if they are just like nah we'll pass and and how how will I ever convince anybody in their right mind to like make a career change someday if we get some money raised and to come work on a staff where we have no benefits back then except I would tell people the benefits are heavenly I thought of all these things that I'd been afraid of. How would we get it started? How would we raise the funds? And, and at that point, 20 years ago, I was still single. And I was wondering, how will I ever meet the right gal to get married? If I don't ever get married because I'm so busy starting a church, then I guess I don't ever get to have kids. And there was just all these doubts and confusions and questions that I had had 20 years ago. So many reasons to say no. But I knew that God was saying go. In Romans 4, Paul's going to tell us, the way you become one of Abram's children is by doing what Abram did. Trust in the one true God and you'll be blessed as Abram was. Well, Abram packed up, and he headed off to a land he'd never seen, hundreds of miles away, where, remember, back in those days, there was no Google Maps, there was no Waze, there was no iPhones. He couldn't look ahead and see kind of what's it going to look like. It represented a totally different world for him. And yet we know that he believed because of the third thing. He obeyed. Abram obeyed God. We see that in verse 5. See, talk is cheap. My father-in-law sometimes says, you've got to put shoe leather on your faith and walk it out. Now, any of us can come up with a hundred what-ifs and reasons not to do what we know that God's telling us to do. And, but God never offered to be anybody's consultant God doesn't come giving us a menu of options or suggestions. Choose the ones that you like. No, he gives us his word. Which means when he says jump, there's only one right answer. And that answer is how high as you're on your way up. John Calvin said when God called Abram, it was like God was saying, Abram, just close your eyes and take my hand. I like that. Close your eyes and take my hand. So on August 15th, 1998, I closed my eyes and took God's hand with all my unanswered questions and moved by faith to my third floor apartment on Cypress Wood. And 20 years later to the night with the rest of my family sleeping. I sensed the... Lord, highlighting, pinpointing every one of those doubts and question marks that I had had and just going down the list, checking every one of them off. See, I answered that. I took care of that. This happened. And not only those things, but he reminded me 
This is something very important. He reminded me, whenever you step forward in obedience, you're never the only one who's going to get blessed. No, see, because when you step out in faith, it causes a ripple effect that brings blessing into the life of others. That's how God's will works. So even as I was sitting there in the dark praying the other night, he brought to my mind people who've, been, who've come into Faith Bridge and we, we prayed over them and they got healed. And I thought of any number of other people who trusted in Christ, who've, who, who've accepted Christ and become believers here at Faith Bridge. And I thought of some who've even gone out from here into full-time ministry and doing ministries in other cities and starting churches like in DC. And I brought to my, and he brought to my mind folks like Dan and Becky Slagle who, who moved shortly after I did and said, we'll come and join you. They moved from Georgia, leaving what they had always known to be home so that he could help give leadership here and at our international ministries. And I thought of Jen and Dylan uh, Lucas, who came from Dallas so that he could um, kind of rebuild our youth program and eventually become our executive pastor. And I thought of Seth and Allie Martin, who, who came and joined us from Lubbock, who now leads this thriving Mission Road that sends, what, 500 or more people out every year on Mission Road journeys one and two week experiences where people are having their own God encounters. And even brought to my mind a few people who because they came here, met their future spouse and got married. Which never would have happened if here wasn't here. And I felt the Lord reminding me of all the dreams plans that our lead team and our lay elders have that we're, you're going to hear more about in the coming six to 12 months. And I just couldn't help but sense him saying, the best is yet to come. So last Wednesday night, I felt like God just said, aren't you glad that you stepped when I said step? He's done immeasurably more than I ever could have asked or imagined. Well, Abram, he had no idea what God was going to do through him. But the whole chain of events started with his first step of obedience when God said, move. But what if he had said, no, I have resolved I'm not going to move. You know what would have happened? Probably not much which is what I am afraid I see happening in a lot of people's lives today. Not much. So let's get this right down to the practical for every one of us as we work towards the close. Any number of you, you can't figure out why am I sort of in this groundhog day thing of life going on? I think it might be because you're saying no in a certain area of your life. To some of you, he's been saying, I want you to move. From what? I want you to move out of your job. You know I've been saying this is not the job for you, but you keep hanging on to that job. I'm saying move. To others of you, he's saying move. Where? Out of isolation. You keep pulling yourself back and you live this isolated life. Why don't you move into the land of community? Sign up for the Faith Bridge and Fajitas coming up and get plugged into a, a, a thriving grow group this coming, this coming school year and have some friends that you can pray with and, and enjoy life with. To others, he's saying, you need to move. From where? From the land of grudge holding and bitterness? You've just built a condo in this land of bitterness, and I'm telling you, move. You need to move into the land of forgiveness. Get going. To others of you, yet, he's he's been saying, you need to move. Where? Out of the land of flirtatiousness. You know you've got this little flirty thing going, and it works. You kind of got it down. It always works in the short run. But what's it ever lead to? Nothing. Nothing significant or meaningful. Stop it. You need to move. Get out of that land. Get yourself out of that. Others of you, you need to move out of unfaithfulness. You need to move into the land of marital faithfulness. Others of you still, you need to move. You're where you, you've, you've settled in the land of stinginess and selfishness. 
And he's saying, I want you to move to the land of generosity. To others of you, he's saying, I want you to move. From where? You're angry. You're always angry and bombastic. You need to move into the land of spirit-filled gentleness. Some of you, he's saying, you need to move. Where do I need to move? You need to move out of the land of being sedentary. You, you, you need to remember that I, through my Holy Spirit, I'm living inside of your body. You need to just move and get healthy. See, all of us have our lands of Ur and Haran. And the Lord is saying to all of us, nobody gets a pass. It's time for you to move. You got to move. Because we don't get to go further into God's will until we've acted obediently on the word that he's already given us. See, we don't get to design detours around the parts. Well, I don't like that part. I'll just, no. See, obedience is the only way to the path of purpose in our life. That's the only way we experience God's purpose for our lives. Now, before I close, I want to just anticipate two very quick questions that are on some of your minds right now and answer those. The first one, some of you are answering, you're like, okay, how do I, but how do I hear God's word for me? Well, let me ask you, are you reading his word? I mean, that's one of the tools that you have. He's given us his word. Are you reading in it every day the way my friend Rob was one day? Are you here regularly? I hope that you'll commit and say, I'm going to be here this whole series. I'm not going to miss the one unless I have to be out of town for something. But I'm going to be here. Because there's something about being in the great assembly that postures us in a position of readiness, more readiness to hear from God. What about your devotional life? Are you spending time with God in prayer and devotion um, daily in your own lives? You say, I don't have a plan. I've even got a plan for you. Here's what you do. Pull out your phone and text to 797979 the word purpose. Just put that word purpose in there. Press 797979 and send. And it'll send you devotions that we've written. We said, let's just get people going three times a week. If you're not meeting with God any, we're not going to go for seven out of seven. We're going to go for three. How about you can set aside three times per week in the coming six or seven weeks as we're in this series. I want you to do that. Text the word purpose and you'll get our daily devotions that, that gives you no excuse. You can hear from God. All of us can. All right? We've got the tools. Let's use them. Second question. Some of you are asking right now, you're like, I know what I need to do. Even when you were talking, I know where I'm supposed to move. I know what that means for me in my life, but how in the world am I going to have the strength to do it? Well, bad news, good news. Bad news is you won't have the strength to do it because if you did have the strength to do it, you probably would have already done it. Good news. There's one who's better, who does have that strength. One who is even better than Abram, Jesus the one who came from heaven, taking the form of a man, and in obedience, even obedience to death on the cross, he went to that cross for your sins and for mine, that we could be forgiven. And then he rose from the grave, triumphing to the world. If you will just link yourself to me, I will come in through my Holy Spirit and I'll live inside of you and I'll give you my resurrection power, the supernatural power that you need to take the step you gotta take now to move. So don't look at yourself. Don't look at your inadequacies. Look to Jesus. That's where the strength will come from. After all, he too knows what it feels like to have to move because the Father told him in heaven, now you're going to move 
from here into that fallen world. So he's walked the path ahead of us. Cling to him. Amen? Let's pray together. Well, now, Lord, I want to pray for every person who's here. Because I just have a sense that there's some business that you want to do with any number of us. Even as I've studied Abraham this, Abraham this summer, I have just thought there's movements in, in every one of our lives that you, you're looking for this next move. And so many of us are in that cul-de-sac groundhog day because we just, we're putting up our, our hand. We're putting up the fist and saying, no, I don't, I'm not going to move. But God, I just have a sense that this is today and in the coming weeks, this is going to be a significant series for us. And I want to pray for three categories of people, Lord. The first category of people, I, I want to pray, if you've never said yes to Jesus in the first place, that's the move you've got to make before you make any other move. You've got to have a Savior. You've got to have the risen Christ and his power and his strength residing inside of you. And so I'm going to invite you right now. To, you can borrow the words that I'm using to sort of paraphrase and make your own prayer, but you just tell him, Lord Jesus, I need you to come into my life because my soul is a vacuum and I need you to fill it. And I'm asking you to come in, Jesus, and forgive me. Forgive me of my sinfulness and my short-sightedness and my controlling nature. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness and fill me full of your spirit so that I might be empowered to live the life with purpose that you've created for me to live. Today's the, line, the day I'm crossing the line. I'm giving my life to you, Jesus. If you just prayed that prayer, I want you to just, would you raise your hand? Just hold your hand up so that I can see your hand right now. Amen. Good. Good. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Good. All right. Now I want to pray for a, a second category of people. This is perhaps the majority of you. I just have a, a sense in my soul that there's any number of you who, especially by the end of the message, you were thinking, oh yeah, now I know why I came and that is what I need to do. But you're wondering, how am I going to do that? And, and I want to pray for you. Um, but before I pray, I want you to take a step right now. Not, not a step out of your row, but I just want you to stand up. Would you stand up? Because I want to know who I'm praying for. If you need courage to take a step of faith to be obedient, why don't you just stand up right now? Say, so, I am one of those people. I'm going to take a step forward. Good. Amen. Wonderful. Good. Now, Lord, you see every person who's standing in both rooms. You know what it is that you've been calling them to do and what they know now, I've got to do this. God, would you give them your courage? Would you give them your strength? Would you give them your grace? Give them what they need to take that step to make whatever move it is that you've been calling them to do so that they can experience the full flow of your blessing and your goodness, Lord. I'm just praying blessings upon them in the strong name of Jesus. And then I'm, I want to pray for a third category of people, and that's really everybody. I'm going to ask us all to stand in both rooms. You just stand up right now, everybody. Everybody right now. And, and the reason I'm having you stand right now is because we're a church family. We're a body. We're a family. And we can't really make the moves of faith that we need without the strength that is provided by one another. And so I'm going to ask you right now, to, I, want you, well, I want us to pray for one another. There's a person who's standing to your right and you may have come with them or you may have no idea who they are, but that's okay. Either way, they will benefit from your prayers. I want you just to pray right now, God, whatever it is that you're calling this man or this woman to, whatever you've been whispering to them, maybe even in this sermon right now, would you give them the grace and the strength and the courage and the tenacity and the boldness that they need to make the move to walk faithfully with you? You just pray that silently for the person to your right.
And then there's a person standing to your left, and I want you to do the same thing for that person to your left. I want you to just pray, Lord, would you give them their daily bread, give them all the supernatural power that they need to move forward in faith with you. I'm praying for an anointing upon their lives and upon their families. You give them grace and strength and courage and boldness and whatever else that they need to make the move that they need to take now. Lord, thank you for this chance to come, to worship, to be a part of the great assembly, to be a part of the things that you're doing. Life is never better than when we are smack dab in the center of your will. Won't you help us, even as we go this week, to stay right there in the center of your will, learning how to be increasingly attuned to it and obedient to it as well. We pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Let's give God a big hand for the things that he's doing in our life. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you are here. I want to see you next Sunday. I hope that you have a great week. You're dismissed. Go in peace. We'll see you next Sunday. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Well, hello and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, young adult pastor here at FaithBridge. I'm sitting with Pastor Ken, who just preached the first series in the Path to Purpose uh, sermon series. We have a few questions in, but before we start on that, you issued us a challenge about reading uh, the Bible. Yeah, um, God's Word. Open this up, opening it up this week. Um, but before, could you tell us a little bit more about that and yeah. a method? Sure. Um, so the method that. That, that we're going to refer to in those devotions, mm-hmm. text purpose to 797979, um, is what we call SOAP, S-O-A-P. It's Mm -hmm. the rhythm that I like to use in my devotions. Mm -hmm. And um, it's rather simple. You just read the prescribed uh, verses for the day that are already selected for you. As you're reading, you're saying, God, show me one verse, because our brains can't remember three and five and seven. Mm -hmm. And you you, you need one thing to ponder throughout the day as you're thinking about God's word. One thing, one verse, Lord, you make that one verse stand out. You get that verse. As you're Mm -hmm. reading, you just put a check, maybe here, maybe there, maybe it could be several, but then you just say, God, which one is the one? And he'll show you. Mm -hmm. That's your verse. Write the verse down. Longhand or type it in. That's your S. Mm -hmm. Your O, that stands for observation. Mm -hmm. And that's where you just write down some observations. A lot of the, the, you know, the start of this series, I was Mm -hmm. just making observations about the text. Um, Some things that I observed about where they were living, some things about uh, the observations that God was saying, you you need to leave this that is familiar and comfortable. And wow, you got to put yourself in. So just make some observations that, that you're, and then you move to the application Okay, so what is it that you're wanting me to do with this verse today? Maybe the verse is about forgiveness. Maybe the verse is about, uh, you know, well, any number of things. Mm -hmm. But you just go ahead and write my application for this verse today. I believe God's saying this. Mm -hmm. You write that out. And then the P stands for prayer. And you just simply uh, uh, write a culminating uh, prayer Mm -hmm. or concluding prayer, Lord, in light of this verse that I was just reading about forgiveness, I pray that you would really give me the grace to be forgiving, you know, whatever. Right. And right there, you have a nice um, little piece that you can stick in your pocket and you take it with you, mm-hmm. with you throughout the day right. and continue to ponder that. You'll be surprised if you do that day after day how you do begin to hear from God very regularly yeah. because he's speaking to us through his word, mm-hmm. if we just go to it. Right. So scripture, observation, application, prayer. prayer. Awesome. I know yeah. that 
if you'll take that seriously, that'll transform it will. life. It does. Well, cool. Well, we have a few other questions in. Uh, first one, in the opening video, uh, three religions were shown in that. Could you just speak a little yeah. bit on how three religions can find Abraham kind of as their center as point their and father? father. Yeah. Sure. Well, um, we're going to be most familiar with Judaism mm -hmm. and Christianity, which of course comes out of uh, Judaism mm -hmm. several thousand years later. Um, but th there is also Islam. Mm -hmm. um, and the way that they uh, see themselves in this story is through another son, not the son Isaac, but the son that Abraham, Abraham will have called Ishmael. Mm -hmm. and we'll get to that story in a few weeks. Um, I don't know that we'll talk a great deal about Islam in this series, but mm -hmm. I do plan in January that we're going to do a sermon on Islam yeah. because it's increasingly a prevalent question that people are having, you know, what, kind of what do they believe and, and, and this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So we will get to that in the course of the, the uh, where we're going this year. Cool. Yeah. Well, I can't wait for that. I know that'll be great. Well, another one we have. Um, it says, why is obedience uh, sometimes made more difficult by us? Yeah. That idea that it sounds simple, but yeah. maybe not. <laughs> yeah, it sounds simple, right, doesn't it? Um, but actually doing it is, and I think one of the things that complicates it mm -hmm. is uh, sometimes we seek out too many counselors. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there's a verse in Proverbs that says there's wisdom found in the counsel of many. Mm -hmm. And that is true if the many that you're drawing near to are uh, Bible-believing, <laughs> Jesus-loving, right. spirit-filled believers who are really gonna be prayerful and take seriously what it is you're wrestling through. And, and, and many times we do get confirmation right. and we, they, God speaks through those brothers and sisters to us. I think the problem is sometimes when we are sensing uh, God is saying, go to this way, go to the right, go to the left. We don't like that at, at first. Mm -hmm. We don't go to the kind of counselor that I just described, <laughs> but to our non-believing, secular, uh, what's God got to do with anything kind of friend right. and say, you don't think that I should do this. And so, well, you ask one or two people that and you get that ringing around. That'd be crazy. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that? Well, you, that'll start to confuse you. Mm -hmm. And, and, it's because you didn't go to the right people and you mm -hmm. started listening to them. And, and I think that many times is, is, is how we're complicating. Right. Um, because obedience is, um, it's not complicated. Mm -hmm. and it's not easy, mm -hmm. but it's not really complicated. It's, it's usually pretty clear what right. we have to do. Right. Makes sense. <laughs> well, cool. Well, our final question that we have is, uh, what if the move for me is to actually stay? Yeah, yeah, because I was do doing a lot of, you need to move from this land to mm -hmm. this land, from this land. I, <laughs> I got thinking about a preacher friend of mine mm -hmm. who tells a story of one day, it was a July 4th Sunday, mm -hmm. and in the church where he is, he preached that it was all about God bless America, mm -hmm. and they sang the God bless America, and they sang mm -hmm. uh, patriotic songs. It was that kind of service. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was standing at the door, and a lady comes out, shakes my hand, and she says, that was a wonderful sermon, and through it, I know that God was telling me I need to go home and get divorced. And he was like, Whoa. What? How did you get that from the white, red, white, and blue? And God bless America. And, and the, the the point I, of telling that little funny story, I think sometimes we juxtapose our will mm -hmm. uh, and give God credit for it right. when that's not what He was saying. So it's very possible that God is is saying to somebody, the move you need to make is not to move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not to move forward, because I'm calling you to stay. And right. so I think that's very important to, to hit on here, um, because we don't want to force moves, right. and worse, to, to blame God. And say, well, God told me, no, I don't think that was God. I think yeah. that that was just you ramming your will into the situation. Right, that makes sense. So sometimes 
we are called to stay. Yeah. And and it, it, sometimes that's a hard word to hear because we would like to move mm -hmm. or we'd like to get out of this or maybe he's saying stay in that job. Mm -hmm. I don't want us to, but I put you there. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it is stay. And like you were saying in the sermon, that prayer and daily Bible reading is what helps us discern right. whether to stay or right. whether to go. And the right community. Right. Brothers and sisters like small groups that we have who, with people who really are going after God right. and really going to try to be discerning and, according to, and give guidance according to His Word. That's awesome. Cool. Well, thank you, Ken, for a great start to the series. Look forward to uh, where we go in the life of Abraham. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining us in Postscript. We'll see you back next week as we continue the path to purpose here at FaithBridge. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.